Good evening, everyone. I'm William Whitaker, the Chief Executive of the Institute of Directors, and I would like to welcome you to this um, major issues seminar that is run by um, Local Government New Zealand in association with the Institute of Directors. And tonight's topic is about governance. Um, I'm only here to do the, um, the welcoming and the housekeeping, and should you look around and people are swaying? <laughs> it's either <laughs> you've drunk too much of Simpson Grierson's wonderful um, wines that they've put on, uh, on display, or it's an earthquake. <laughs> but I'm assured by the, um, one of the um, senior partners at Simpson Grierson that this is a very safe building, and all you need to do is sit back and enjoy it. <laughs> um, my colleague uh, Malcolm Alexander's approach is slightly different and Malcolm, as Chief Executive of Local Government New Zealand, takes a very collectivist approach and he thinks that if there is an earthquake, let's all stand up, join hands, dance around in a circle and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> so, and on that, I would like to introduce my um, uh, colleague Malcolm Alexander, the Chief Executive of Local Government New Zealand. Uh, welcome everybody tonight and a special acknowledgement for Simpson Grierson for the venue and putting on, on the drink, so thank you very much. Uh, tonight's con um, uh, topic, why good governance uh, matters in local government. Um, and just a quick bit of context here. Uh, as a sec oh, sorry about that. sort of in your face this really isn't it <laughs> uh, as a um, as a sector we're um, we're committed to raising the bar when it comes to how we manage things and how we account uh, to our ratepayers and to the community as a whole um, but it's, so it's about taking ownership of issues and how can we improve what are the learnings from things that don't work well what are the learnings from things that do so tonight we've got three speakers to help us try to uh, explore that topic a little more and what we'll do is uh, have each of the three speakers uh, speak in turn and then at the end turn it over to a bit of Q&A and actually get a bit of interaction going if we can. What are the issues on your mind from a government perspective? What, are you, what is it you want to hear uh, from, from the panel? Um, uh, so that's the way we'll go and the idea is to sort of wrap up around about uh, from here around about seven and then adjourn to um, two more convivial things that are waiting us at the back of the room. Three speakers today. Our first speaker is the Honourable uh, David Cunliffe. Now David, I'll give a bit of a bio, I've got the bios here, all three of them. Uh, the son of an Anglican minister. Uh, David was born in 1963 into Arawa. He has a Master of Public Administration from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government where he held a Fulbright scholarship. David worked as a management consultant with the Boston Consulting Group in Auckland from 1995 to 1999 before standing for Labour in the seat of Titirangi, which became the New Lunar electorate in 2002. In 2003, David was appointed to Cabinet as, a minister, as Minister of State and Associate Minister of Finance and Revenue and Communications and Information Technology. In 2004, he became the Minister for Communications and Information Technology, which is where I first ran across David um, and when I was Chair of the TCF, and we did some good stuff there. He went on to become Minister of Immigration and later Minister of Health. As Minister for Communications and Information Technology, he forced Telecom to unbundle its local loop mon monopoly and you know, explode competition in the telco market. David Cunliffe is the 14th leader of the Labour Party and the next Prime Minister of New Zealand. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. I'm very excited about um, the mix of being able to see uh, local government New Zealand and uh, the Institute. Uh, and I have to begin with a confession. Uh, I'm a Westie. I know. But I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it because in the People's Republic of Waitakere City, as it then was, I learned a thing or two about community development and from the grassroots up. I've seen the contribution that visionary local government leadership can make to a sometimes challenged community. And I want to particularly acknowledge the former mayor of the Waitakere Eco City, Sir Bob Harvey. West Auckland is a rich tapestry of community groups on all sorts of topics, intersecting with local and regional government in a way that has heart and vision. I've seen firsthand the contribution that community development can make in building resilient communities. Right now, 
By contrast, I believe uh, we have a situation where our regions are slipping behind and community development is something that is honoured in name more than practice. And this has led to two outcomes. One is first straight up economic opportunity cost. We are not generating the wealth we should have or could do. The other is that we've not been giving people in our regions the opportunities that they need to stay in their hometowns and have stable, secure <coughs> lives in their own regions. And this is self-perpetuating. When the cycle turns and people don't see opportunities near where they live, they uproot and go and they take with them their talents, the human capital needed to build the next generation. The result has been a hollowing out of too many of our regions and that's left too many of our formerly vibrant provincial towns and cities as shadows of their former selves. We aim to partner with you to help break this cycle and rebuild and revitalise our regions. Let me offer a few thoughts about the direction of travel of our approach to uh, regional partnerships and the governance of the relationship between central, regional and local government. A core part of our economic vision has been to take a more hands-on approach to growing local economies. If we don't work to build our regional potential, we simply cannot expect our national economy to reach its potential. It's this need for, if you like, a new regionalism that was behind my recent announcement that we would create central government-backed community task forces to step into provincial towns that found themselves in trouble. For example, Shannon, on the case of a major industrial closure. In circumstances where a major employer is closing down or a similar economic shock, shock is hitting a province, it's vital that we quickly bring local stakeholders together with the Crown and that we facilitate ways to stop or mitigate the economic and social damage that those shocks cause. But community task forces, in all honesty, are a bit of a stopgap measure. While they're better than the current practice of just leaving it to the market, we need a less short-term, more transformative approach if we're to build truly resilient communities and regions. A few thoughts on how. Well, Labour's approach to regional development is going to be both more active and more partnering with communities. It's based on the certainty that not all the best ideas in New Zealand come from Wellington. In our new network world, we can build on good ideas wherever they spring up. We can empower citizens and we can realise potential by getting alongside them and backing their dreams. I call it politics with, not for. By contrast, the current government seems very much about being hands-off in terms of the support it offers. It still seems to believe in the perfection of the invisible hand of the market, but it also seems quite top-down and perhaps transactional in terms of its decision-making. Perhaps it's shown that it was never truly committed to honest partnerships with local government, because around the country communities are suffering. The Labour government I lead will be, by contrast, hands-on and partnering. We recognise that if we're to achieve long-term structural changes in our regions, we need to work alongside the people and organisations from those regions, and the big decisions need to be made together. Our world is changing so fast, it's speeding up. Few ideas or projects are sustainable when they're just pushed down from the top. So to succeed in this new world, we need to build a new form of engagement, new partnerships between central and local government, with iwi, with powered up economic development agencies, with our communities. We recognise that you and local government know your world better than Wellington does. And we would like to see a more devolved system of governance, for example, devolution from NZTE of its domestic footprint through a powered up system of EDAs. And it would be a more devolved system that works more closely with local communities. We're not interested in being so-called white knights riding into town from the capital. Let's take a couple of examples. Let's look for example at Northland. Northland has some forestry assets but very little processing in part because it's quite expensive and difficult to truck raw logs 
And because there's no rail link from the port out, we'd like to sit down with stakeholders in Northland and work through the economics of being a co-investor in an upgraded rail link to help ongoing growth in the region. In this kind of longer term work, the Crown is, when we reflect upon it, an ideal partner. We have a lower cost of capital, we're a secure long term investor, we take a whole of economy and whole of society balance sheet approach, and we're not going anywhere. We are also prepared to listen. If we're serious about this new sense of partnership, this new form of development, then we also don't want it to be episodic. If we want to make real change happen, if we want to make the Kiwi boat go faster, if we want to plan for our economy, then we need to systematise that kind of regional engagement. That means we need regional stakeholders to be ready, willing and able to engage. Currently, central government's winding back the local government's legislative framework so that rather than being able to support the four well-beings, economic, social, uh, cultural and environmental, you're now being told to stick to your so-called knitting of rates, rats and rubbish. We think that approach is rubbish. We think that if the country is going to thrive, local government has a bigger role to play than that and a bigger role to play than now. We also believe that in many areas that role can be done more efficiently by local government than by the Crown. A new regionalism requires more structured forms of engagement between local and central government, potentially through LGNZ, where stakeholders meet regularly with a wide range of ministers for systematic and regular interaction. The beginnings of such an approach were developed during the last Labour government with its local government forum. We plan to expand on that foundation and we would like to speak with local government New Zealand about how to do so effectively. In the same way, we're also going to build on the last Labour government's program of iwi fora, where we go and meet regularly with different iwi and hapu around the country. We're already making a down payment on that approach in the form of our community cabinets. We're running shadow cabinet meetings in regional centres and towns all around New Zealand every parliamentary session, and our next one is in Napier. Lawrence, you're welcome to come. <laughs> but you'd have to get a passport to get to Napier from Hastings. We'll, you know, we'll talk to Barbara. Um, once a session, which is once, uh, roughly once a month, we are taking the entire cabinet around the regions and the plan is to meet with key stakeholders, local government, chamber of commerce, local iwi, local community groups. We're getting to know them. We're hoping that they will get to know us and our ministers in waiting. That means that on becoming government, we will have already built the regional relationships we need to drive this kind of project uh, when in government. So we've been to Dunedin and Christchurch. Next week it's Napier. It's early days, but we're walking the talk. Personally, I've also had uh, recently the privilege of a regional visit to Tauranga, and I was really struck by the work of the Tauranga EDA Priority 1 and its economic development planning. It makes it so easy for central government to engage when there is already a well thought through regional economic development strategy, and it is so much better for the government from Wellington to partner with those who are close to the resource and skill endowments of their regions who can simply engage with what is already on the ground. Priority one had a well thought through strategy which identified priorities for engagement, identified opportunities in tourism, horticulture, manufacturing, it recognised the constraints, it found its skill gaps, and it was exactly the kind of careful planning work that just makes it so easy to engage and help good things to happen. Another example is in my own electorate of New Lynn. There, a growing problem with a traffic snarled motorway offshoot, Clark Street, and a soon to be twin tracked western rail line was looking like a transport disaster, an at grade intersection that was never going to be able to cope with the volume. Six or seven years ago, that problem became the turnkey for a local central government partnership that invested in dropping the rail line underground, building a state-of-the-art transit uh, and railway station, and redeveloping the commercial heart of the town as part of a strategic master plan which has included commercial, residential 
and public infrastructure. $300 million of co-investment later, that's just the local and central government investment. That place has been transformed. I remember having an argument at the time with the Treasury analyst about their BCR calculations. Has anyone here had a similar discussion with them? Surprise me. I asked them what they had put in for uh, economic development multipliers or spin-offs from the transport investment. The answer was zero. I asked why they thought that was realistic. They said because uh, it was hard to quantify. And I asked them why they thought hard to quantify meant zero. And, uh, you know, I won the argument. The Minister of Finance signed the cheque, but the result has surpassed my expectations. Uh, over 50% of the properties within a kilometre radius of that railway station have changed ownership since that development plan instigated. Uh, we have a 14-storey mixed-use medical centre, commercial and residential building springing up right next to it, and that's the spearhead of a wave of large-scale commercial redevelopment which has transformed that suburb from being a third-rate dormitory area to being a new kind of cool place that Generation Y is saying is a really good place to get a, a flat or a house, a first home, because it's a good commute from the central city. It sprang out of a partnership with Bob Harvey's Waitakere City, local MP had a little bit to do with it, and central government and Infratil, I have to give credit to the late Lloyd Morrison, he was part of the planning for that, that, that gave us the confidence uh, to move forward. The same thing's happening in Westgate, we want the same thing to happen in Avondale, which is a disaster area. The same thing is underway already in New Brighton, and we've committed to partnering with that in Christchurch. And there are other urban developments where we believe we can make a real difference to help local and regional governments scale up to achieve transformational change. And of course, housing and transport are central areas of public infrastructure which are crucial to that and having the Crown engage as a partner makes everything else so much easier. There's a second part to partnership and that's making sure that central government is ready, willing and able to work with regions. We want to make sure that ministries and their processes are in the right shape to deal with the task at hand and that they're open and receptive to equal engagement. There's a need to re-examine the increased centralisation of decision making that has characterised the current government's relationship with local government. From installing the commissioners in Christchurch to the proposed changes to the RMA to the hurried creation of the super city, although it's been made to work, there's been a tendency to shape process and legislation in ways that remove local communities and local government's ability to choose their own future. So we want to look at some of the economic development opportunities, and there are really good ones. But they aren't at the scale or level of specialisation that they need to be at. So we're going to sit down with the EDAs and ask them what tools they need, what scale they want to be good partners in a devolved system from the relevant central government agencies, MBIE and NZTE. We look forward to a structured set of delegations and engagement which occurs within a strategic framework where the criteria are transparent and where there is one set of widely shared rules of the road, not an informal set for the friends of the in crowd and another set for everybody else. We need a region sector matrix. We are a geographically diverse nation and most of the regions have their own specific core competencies, whether it's fishing in Nelson, tourism in forestry in Rotorua, or wine in Marlborough. There is a case to be made for engagement that partners with, develops and leverages the core competencies that are unique to each region. So it's not a one-size-fits-all or single industry approach to economic development. We want to use the Crown's investment muscle to help the boat go faster, whether it's through specific research and development or identifying and funding particularly important infrastructure or some other kind of tailored response. The whole point is we don't want Wellington telling the regions what the intervention should be. We want to go into the spaces of our nation with open hearts and open minds and a reasonably open checkbook.
Let me sum up. It should come as no surprise to anyone that has kept even half an eye on the Labour Party that we are going to be taking a more active approach than has been seen in the last 30 years. Unlike other parties, we've taken some lessons from the global financial crisis and we recognise that it's time to move beyond a third way politics and find a new way of doing things. But the 21st century version of an active progressive state must be a partnering state. It can't be a top-down, capital city-driven state. It needs the form of engagement that I'm talking about with the regions. If you like, it's a shift of the governance model from top-down to grassroots as well as from passive to active, from transactional to strategic, and from favouritism to fairness. Good governance embodied in a new regionalism is fundamental to achieving a higher value, more productive economy and a fairer and more resilient society. Good governance in the post-GFC, post-internet environment requires us to think and govern in partnership, not simply to hold up our hands and let the market take its course. We must govern well and we must govern together. Thank you very much. Our, um, our next speaker uh, is uh, Michael Stiasny, Vice President of the Institute of Directors. Uh, he's a chartered accountant, lawyer and senior partner of Corda Mentha, uh, the leading New Zealand specialist independent corporate advisory and turnaround firm. He is one of New Zealand's most expe experienced workout professionals and company directors and over his 30 year career in New Zealand and the UK has concentrated on the spectrum of financial consulting services incorporating insolvency, forensic accountancy, company restructuring, due diligence and the provision of strategic financial and management advice. In addition to his significant public profile resulting from his role as receiver <laughs> in some of New Zealand's largest insolvencies, Michael was a director of a number of private and public companies including chairman of Victor Limited, Chairman of Nati Fatua Arakai Fai Rawa, I need to work on my Maori pronunciation limited, and a founding member of the 25% group which is targeting board diversity as a means of improving corporate performance. Uh, welcome, Michael, to the podium. Um, well, I feel like a bit like uh, the ham in the middle of the sandwich. Um, anyway, thanks for uh, inviting me here this evening. Um, it's a pleasure to. Uh, represent the Institute of Directors and a special thank you to Simpson Grierson for uh, hosting the event. Um, good governance is what I meant to talk about. Um, I think very simply good governance is about a process. Um, for some it's just simply about a good outcome that uh, generates uh, excessive profit. Um, but for others of us, and I presume most of us in this room, and those of us who are currently in the real world, in the new world that's coming, I think it is something slightly different. It's about a process that is actually above reproach. Um, and I could speak, well we could all speak I think and discuss for hours the definition of what profit is in today's world. The necessity to talk about long-term reward, to talk about intergenerational issues, to talk about health and safety, to talk about ethical behaviour, to name a few, probably something that we can talk about a lot in Auckland. Um, but these are all parts of the equation that come together for good governance. Local government though, it's actually quite easy because the structure is well defined. It's already set down either by um, the beehive or indeed by bylaw. So we can't actually do a lot about the structure. But we can focus on the process and the discipline. So in my world, the business world, um, the emphasis on making money, it's about adding value. And that's, I think, how every good director should look at um, their occupation. It is one about adding value. Have they made something of what they started with and left it in a better way? So it's about taking on successful ventures, but also by not putting the house at risk every day when you do it. And it's about balancing those two together. Um, most of the suits in New Zealand, for some unknown reason, um, think of local government in a completely different tone. And I think Malcolm's role was probably to change that 
and uh, you're on a journey. So uh, I wish you luck. I don't think it's that easy. But um, we have this continual concept that um, we don't particularly trust central government people, but we probably trust local government people even less. Um, and that's the environment New Zealand is in. But we do need to change it. And I think it's up to everyone involved in local government to actually try and do something. And the way I saw it was, perhaps you simply have to say you're actually no different than anyone else. So if I'm a, um, involved in a board, then I'm responsible to the shareholder and I'm responsible to ensure the staff are looked after and all the other, um, well, I'm interested in diversity, all those other things are part of my role. As a councillor, I couldn't quite work out what the difference was. Simply, you're there on behalf of the ratepayer to do exactly the same thing. And if we can start changing that shift and create, you don't agree, obviously, we're going to have a good question later. Um, but we are there, to, in my view, to look after the best interests of all for the long-term benefit of all. And it's the same issue, whether it's a company, whether it's a council, whether it's a school board, whether it's a religious entity, whether it's the family dairy, um, whether it's a council-controlled organisation. They're all actually identical. Um, so when you look after assets for other people, you must be in governance, and that's where we need to end up. Um, yes, there will be a difference in approach, but the approach is actually not that different when you peel back the onion. And I think we, we have to engage in peeling back the onion rather than letting us say um, local government people are just different and move on. So um, local government, I mean, we have the first thing, I think, is to try and get... Um, the message out there, which I think we all appreciate but we don't wish to be reminded of, that local government plays a major part in our lives. I mean, it's actually more engaging in our lives than central government. Um, in some respects, I think Len Brown has a better role than John Key, or the next Prime Minister for that matter, um, because he actually doesn't have to deal with such a wide spectrum. He actually just has to deal with this area, but he has total control and probably slightly less accountability. So it's not a bad place. So perhaps we have to talk about lifting up um, those people involved in local government, making them feel tall about what they're doing, because it isn't all bad. Um, councils have a material influence on what happens today and, most importantly, what happens in the future. So hence, I'm really... Um, committed to finding, to making sure that those people in local government are going to leave New Zealand in a better place for my children and for other people's children. Their major assets and businesses under their control. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know what the percentage is, but in simplistic terms, it's a very large part of our economy. So, um, local government, just the same as the suit who runs a public company, accountable to shareholders, but they are called ratepayers. Um, rather than shareholders. So how do we achieve good governance and how do we do that very, very quickly? Um, and I've had a little bit of experience uh, watching Auckland City uh, when it was going through a couple of issues uh, when I was involved in Metro Water. Um, first thing is that I think there is some dynamic around the council table that needs work and it needs to be fronted up. And every councillor needs to take responsibility to ensure that they understand their governance role. So yes, they're like an MP, they have been elected by a group of people, but as soon as they enter that chamber, they must, by definition, be responsible to all to get the best outcome. Very simple to say, but again, looking from the outside, I think there's a little bit of work that could be done in making sure that everyone gets that. And and that's what the IOD will do with pleasure, was to help train those people. But it's um, a really deep concept because you don't want to take away from that councillor their belonging to the people who've elected them and they need to feel as though they can look after them. But at the same time, you've got to coach them and coerce them to understand the concept of working together as a team and having a collective responsibility. Um, so 
The next issue is, and I think one that I'm getting a bit passionate about, is that there has been a change in society and there is a change coming around ethical behaviour. Um, and no, I don't mean um, um, activities on couches, but um, it's about the ethical behaviour about how we do business and we're seeing a dramatic change. And if you look around the world, whether it's um, um, Rebecca, um, whatever her name is, and the... Uh, the phone hacking, we're talking at Leighton Industries now in Australia has just been uh, got itself in the poo by paying brown paper bags to do deals in Iran and Iraq. So all of a sudden it's coming to fruition that that isn't an acceptable way of doing business. And so as we come back we need to be seen to act in good faith and we need to be seen to be acting in the best interests of the entity we're involved in. So. Councils have been really good at trying to get these processes sorted and the Auditor General, etc. But I just see this as coming really, really quickly. And we're not, whatever we did yesterday isn't good enough. We are now in a new environment. And it would be really good if councils, I think, took this on board and actually came out ahead of this popularity swing that's going to come. It's here. But I'd get on to it. Um, I think there are just two other issues. Um, the first one is, as I've talked about, the council needs to work effectively. It is incumbent on, just as it is on a chairman of a board, for the mayor to lead those councils. Um, I think there's a hell of a lot of work that needs to be done in just being the Richie McCaw of the council chamber and getting them to understand what the rules are of team engagement and replaying that all the time so people feel proud to be in that room rather than um, as Clayton Cros Cosgrove looked last night when he was speaking on uh, in Parliament at 11 o'clock there was no one to talk to it must have been the most uh, difficult thing in the world to do but um, I guess that's what politicians do but it's making people feel good to be in the chamber to come out with decisions and do something that's good for their city or or town or whatever rather than just for their own constituency. Um, the final issue, and just because it's on my mind now continually, um, is around CCOs and the business end of councils. Um, so I'm involved in Vector and I'm involved in Ngāti Whātua, which is the, the Māoris of Tamaki Makura. Um, I'm exceedingly hard, um, and most people think I'm a bastard, but leaving that aside, <laughs> I also do one thing really good. I communicate with my shareholders really well. So at Vector, my shareholder sits at my board table. It's a public company, but my 75% shareholder has two representatives. Nati Fatua, they've employed some Pakiha because we're very good at managing the assets and we're going to grow the assets. But at the same time, we have members of the tribe sitting with us and we use them and they use us and we communicate through them and we work with them to send the message out and to be transparent about what we're doing. So there are no barriers to that engagement with the masses of the people, whether they're ratepayers or are beneficiaries of the Electricity Consumer Trust or whether they're beneficiaries of Nati Fatwa we've allowed them to come into this corporate environment where, you know, suits say we can't have councillors involved because they don't know what we're doing and they'll bugger it up. But in my view, the more we take down those barriers and allow councillors to actually manage their own assets with other people's help, the better we will all be off. And I think it will help a lot. But just um, just seems to me that there's quite a big issue where there are they are very, two very clear views on it, and uh, as most people would expect, I have one view. Um, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, our last um, speaker is my boss, um, uh, Lawrence Yule, the uh, President of Local Government New Zealand. Uh, before becoming President, uh, Lawrence represented the provincial sector of uh, Local Government New Zealand on National Council. He's been the Mayor of Hastings District since 2001. Uh, where he also won the honour of being uh, the youngest ever mayor for the district. He continues to be at the forefront of not only dis district but regional initiatives. Lawrence has particular interests in transport, water and wastewater issues. He was recently made a fellow 
of the Institute of Professional Engineers New Zealand. Lawrence. Thank you, uh, Malcolm, uh, David and Michael. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, we relish the opportunity to work with the Institute of Directors and um, to partner with them in improving the governance and performance of our elected members and to actually have functions like this and share the message and share the understanding is important to us. Um, early next year we will start delivering a number of governance training modules developed in, in conjunction with the Institute of Directors and there, I'd have to say, is massive interest uh, from our sector in doing so, which is great. Many are eager to start now, and we've actually can't quite get organised quite in the time frame required, which is equally a wonderful thing to see. And our members actually recognise that there is a fast-growing awareness across the sector that we need to raise our standards and accordingly lift the performance of our sector. And it's fair to say, slightly off the notes, that we've had some own goals that have led to that situation. We've had some push from the government to rectify some things. And internally, we have restructured LGNZ and the things we're doing to help ourselves to improve our performance. <coughs> Raising the governance standards of one of our sector, and I apologise, I don't really apologise, there's a number of mayors in the room, but it is, it is something that's really important and a challenge for us. I do not want to be, as a representative, as the Chair of Local Government New Zealand, on TV justifying things that are very hard to justify. So we are moving on and we're doing things that make a difference. And it's our view that it is fundamentally important to the growth, direction and future of New Zealand. Just that it is fundamentally important as to how central government manages things. And you may ask why it's good to do that, apart from what I've just said. But it's actually very easy to take for granted what local government provides every minute of the day across the country and it is incredibly vast, actually. The business of local government is actually vast and multi-talented, uh, multi-faceted rather. It was a surprise to me when I first learnt this that the infrastructure value of our sector alone is around $120 billion. Not far short of the value of, the of central government's infrastructure. So we are a big player in terms of what we look after, what we own on behalf of all ratepayers. We own 90% of the roads. The bulk of the country's water and wastewater networks, libraries, recreation centres, community facilities. Council expenditure every year is about $8.5 billion. So holistically, it's a big number and it's a big part of New Zealand. And we account for approximately 11% of all public expenditure. So it's important we get it right and we provide the best framework for the right decisions to be made. And right around New Zealand, elected representatives supported by skilled council officers oversee scores of services. They are responsible for potable water that comes out of your tap the pavements you walk on, the roads you drive on, the parks and recreational grounds that you exercise or which you cheer your children's sports teams. We provide lighting, take your rubbish away, sort out the sewerage. A whole lot of things that are really important but in many ways most people take for granted that they just occur. The killer is this though. On average the New Zealand household spends $5 a day to get all those things. And on average, most people's power bill alone is now more significant than their total rates cost. And over a period of time, probably New Zealanders, and I'm not sure it's any different to any other country, we begin, we have lost, in my view, the value proposition of what this sector delivers 
why we're set up in the first place, and the collective strength of everything we do. And when I look at what people spend on cell phone technology, coffee, and all sorts of other things, we have lost, uh, in a democratic way, in a public accountability way, as we look at rate increases every year, the big picture value that actually is, is delivered by this sector. And it's fair to say that when you get your rates bill, thinking about things like that aren't top of mind. You generally look at how much have my rates gone up versus last year. And somehow you bastards are inefficient if you haven't got the rates below the rate of inflation. Rather than what is the total cost of all the infrastructure being provided, what actually really should be invested to look after those assets in the long term, and what is the total cost on the country if short-term decisions are made. So those are huge dynamics for us to, to manage, and I think over time um, that dynamic has been lost probably in the last 10 years, and we're on a process of trying to redefine that dynamic. Mayors and councillors are often asked to make tough decisions. It's my experience that the community demand for what we do is only going in one direction, and that is growing. At the same time when the community seems to have a reluctance to pay much more for what's actually been delivered. Now this is no different to the private sector, and Michael, I agree with much of what you said, I don't agree with everything. You would expect that. Uh, and there are significant similarities between the role of elected representatives and that of a director. Certainly the mere chief executive relationship is akin to a board chief, ex chief executive relationship. However, in my view, there are also significant differences. Often a far broader mandate and vision is necessarily brought to the council table than a board table. And I accept what you say uh, about um, if the ethics of doing business, etc., um, it, that is emerging into the space. But a lot of companies previously have been simply focused about profit delivery and what happens on the bottom line. That is not the case. That is not a driver uh, for local government. Equally, the decisions that local government make can often be decisions around infrastructure that may last for 50 years. <coughs> And there are often decisions made about, well, we could do this now, and this is cheaper now, but actually the whole of life cost will be far more expensive, so less invest in longer uh, term infrastructure. That's quite hard to talk your community through sometimes. But those calls are often made. And many of the projects we agonise over in terms of infrastructure are worth tens of millions of dollars each. I accept that private sector companies have big decisions to make too. But I think there is a major difference. In my view, a board member elected or selected for a board is often specifically chosen by that board or those shareholders for their skills and delivering the outcomes of that company. A councillor or community board member is actually usually elected by the community to represent the community's interest and that interest is often greater than their specific skills that they bring in a matrix of mix into a, in a board situation. So in many ways a lot of people that get elected to councils in New Zealand have very limited governance experience and we have identified and I think rightly with your assistance that that is a significant impediment to the growth, management and development of first-rate efficient infrastructure and service delivery. So as I've already mentioned, LGNZ provides intensive induction training and ongoing professional development. Uh, we have, and this builds on our often uh, sought after elected men's governance handbook, providing the best practice governance pillars for the sector. Interestingly enough, we recently ran what I refer to as Mayor's Training School where we take the new mayors, we bring them down here, and we take them through everything uh, that we think would best equipment, equip them for their role. Now one of the most 
fascinating things I've found in that conversation, and it's been repeated this time, where you have a central government politician that is less central government politics and come into local government, there are two things that I often find. One, they don't understand or haven't appreciated the workload and the time commitment and the feet to the fire commitment of being in your electorate in your city every, every single day. Secondly, they often struggle and haven't come across all the issues that they have to, have to deal with, this, the, the, the breadth of issues that they have to deal with. And so that's been quite a revelation to me because when we first ran it, I said, well, what would MPs want to come to our Mayor's Training School for? Because they would know everything. Yeah. Well, some of them think they know everything. <laughs> but actually, it's been nice to hear the value that has been delivered to those people in those training courses. And it does signify me there is a very different role that's played in community leadership. However, I am also aware that we've had some pretty high profile media cases which haven't been too crash hot. Commissioners have been appointed in several councils. The Christchurch City Council's building consent issues has been under review at a time when Christchurch actually needs to have its building consent issues working properly. There is soon to be an Office of the Auditor General report on the Kuiper District sewerage fiasco, and that's what I'll call it, a fiasco. I can't defend it. It was just a shambles. And we actually must never allow those types of things to occur again. I wait on the report, but I'm led to understand it's a variety of things <coughs> led to that happening. So the local government sector does need to lift its game around governance. And we are committed to doing that. My board, Malcolm as Chief Executive, and our strategic plan are looking to do that. We have many very skilled people and strong established and up and coming leaders in our sector. They are passionate and they are committed. They bring a variety of skills to the table. They have energy, integrity, and importantly, what I've observed so far, a real willingness to learn. So we are actually confident that ongoing training, the new government's programme in conjunction with the Institute of Directors, will actually contribute significantly to developing a stronger, more effective and more efficient local government sector. These workshops will focus on key governance, leadership and strategic skills for elected members and contribute to improved governance and performance in the local government sector. Unlike central government, we do not have a centralised public service. We have a whole lot of separate entities that run themselves. And we have good mayors, not so good mayors, room for improvement mayors. We have good chief executives, not so good chief executives, room for improvement chief executives. So we're not an homogenous group. But our aim is to lift the performance of everybody both governance and management, to maximise the opportunity for our sector and improving New Zealand. And it's my view that this joined up programme will make a significant difference and it will allow that to occur. <coughs> the high profile issues which I've mentioned before, I'm not shy about talking about. Many of them should never have happened and that sort of thing needs to be prevented from occurring in the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I want you to understand we are about making some substantial changes at this level of what we do. We are about being part of the solutions, about working with best practice, and that's why we're working with the Institute of Directors. And so far, what I'm observing from my mayoral and elected members' colleagues is they are up for the challenge. Thank you for attending. All the best for the Christmas break. Thank you. Right, um, we, we've gone a little bit over, but um, there's still time for some questions. Um, I've got one to start if everyone's always shy, but unless there's one, great, yeah. over there. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll ask the, tell, uh, if you raise, um, state your name, your question, and, and who you were addressing it to, and I'll call them to the podium. All right, well, I'm addressing it to all three. Okay. Um, Di Buffin from Corridor Consultants. 
I wouldn't doubt for a minute that sound asset management and good economic development are essential for local government. But I think one of the more important things is sustainable environmental management, and not one of you mentioned that. So I'm just wondering, is there anybody from a regional council here? Or in Mike's, so I presume that the regional councils are part of your responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges in... Um, David, you, you raised it really. One of the challenges we have in New Zealand is actually about a balanced growth agenda. Not only in terms of economic growth versus the environment and all the rest of it, but actually economic growth in terms of where it happens geographically in New Zealand. Um, so we have a very strong mandate. In my view, where we've moved in terms of looking after the environment today versus where we were 10 years ago, the public perception and the roles of council play is far, far greater than it was then. So regional councils have moved from catchment boards largely to be, you know, looking after the environment. But I put the challenge out there to all of you. From where I sit, it does not make a lot of sense, for instance, to be worrying about housing affordability, the lack of land in Auckland, congestion pricing and new motorways, when in the rest of New Zealand there is spare capacity People are looking for job opportunities, and there is no plan as to how to do that. And so what's happening in some of those communities, they are looking at what I call slightly more risky things around the environment because they say, we need economic activity. And if I've got a criticism or a challenge to the Leader of the Opposition, I think that's going to be one of the big things that New Zealand's going to have to work out in the next little while. David, do you want to comment? Uh, yeah, I'll make um, <clears throat> two quick comments. Uh, the first is, although I didn't go into it, um, the four well-beings include environment, and uh, we definitely see that as a core part of the mandate of local and regional government. Uh, it goes without saying in the Auckland context the great work that the Auckland Regional Council has done in stewarding our regional parks, and that's passed to Auckland Council. So we do see it as a core function. I spent more time talking about economic development today, but absolutely not to the exclusion of sound environmental management. They are interdependent. Um, there are many win-wins. That's not an excuse to treat the environment as an instrumental good alone, uh, because it has intrinsic worth as well, that it can't be measured and must be passed on. So we, we do see it as core. Uh, Andrew, I'll go to Andrew, I'll sort of hang up first. Okay, David's on his feet, so I'll keep him there, and I'll ask Lawrence this question as well. Uh, look, one of the issues you talked about, David, uh, was this whole economic growth in the regions. And what we know is this concept of stickiness is really important. It's important that New Zealand isn't sticky to enterprises we keep leasing them overseas. So our regions have the same problem. How do they be sticky so they can keep enterprises in their region? And the best answer seemed to be access to capital and access to skills. But what we've done is to centralise our skill development to our major cities. They go there and they don't come back. And that then translates through in a whole variety of ways. So you simply lose the skill base in your regions. So what are you doing to basically make your regions going to do to make your regions sticky to skills? Because if we have great skills out there, we're going to get better counsellors, we're going to get better businesses, we're going to make the regions sticky to economic activity. And I think that relates through to what Lawrence was saying as well. Andrew, um, let me say a couple of words on skills and a couple of words on capital because I think um, what's really interesting is the similarities between the two. Um, in terms of uh, improving the stickiness of skills, that is uh, providing a higher level of supply of skills training, uh, that requires uh, access to funding, which is usually but not always central government funding, and it requires delivery mechanisms that are on site in the local regions in a way that's appropriately delivered and good value for money. Um, so using a, a good strong network of regional politics, making sure that we have uh, centres of vocational excellence across the polytech network would be a good way to help and making sure that the quantum of skills uh, development which is funded is appropriate. We, uh, we make no bones about it that we see that as a core part of an economic development plan. Uh, on the capital side, what's really, really interesting is that the literature is showing that capital is stickier when people know each other. 
right? So if you are an investor and you know the quality of management and a board, you are more likely to leave your capital invested there if they're good, right? And that's a different relationship than if it's being arbitrated simply through an open share market, which is really interesting. Um, and it's, it's pertinent in, in regards to the growth of iwi capital as well as regional economic development because iwi capital is particularly sticky because it's never going to leave the roi, right? Which I actually think is a fabulous thing for New Zealand because, you know, if it's not government owned, iwi owned or regionally owned, it's probably gone, you know, unless it's a mick jobs. Um, finally, in the back end of the capital equation is creating the savings pools we need to accumulate capital, hence Kiwi Saver Super Fund and Secondly, ensuring that it flows to where it can do the most good, which is productive enterprise, not property speculation, hence capital gains tax. Ma'am? Oh, sorry, Lawrence, did you want to say something? Well, just... What I mentioned before is it's not unique to New Zealand, but if you look at what's happening in the world, urbanisation's occurring. So, and I use this figure, 1970, 30% of the population lived in cities and 70% lived in the rural. In 2030, it's going to be completely reversed in the world. Now, in New Zealand, we, we, say, we face the same sort of scenario. So, in a place like where I live in Hastings, one of the best parts of New Zealand to live, people would love to live there, but they actually need a job and they need employment. And if they can't find it, they'll go somewhere where they can. And people, young people particularly, are very portable. So... So it's about ensuring that the regions actually have those jobs and are supported in trying to get a joined up matrix of opportunities across provincial New Zealand really. At the moment if I've got a criticism, it's largely let the market determine everything. Actually it's very hard for a lot of smaller rural and provincial parts of New Zealand to respond to that without some more government intervention. Brenda Pilot from the Public Service Association. Um, I would just like to pick up the point that was made by David about cent the central government behaving differently in a, in a new form of partnership. I would like to hear actually from all of the speakers, what do you want to see from central government and particularly from you David, how are you going to make that happen? Okay. The other speakers the... Michael, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I'm not letting you off lightly, I've got a question for you by the way, just in case. Any comment? No, not at all. Lawrence? Well, yeah. If, if I sort of made the rules, I would say that central government and local government would effectively be joined at the hip, would work out who does what, would support each other in achieving those goals. If I've got a criticism at the moment, there's still a lot of local, central government thinking that somehow local government is a department of central government. We set the rules, you go and do it. Often we've got unfounded mandates, we've got all sorts of things. I don't think that's fair, and, I, and nor do I think actually it is the most efficient use of New Zealand's resources, whether they're taxes or rates. And so I would have a far more balanced relationship if I had my way. This is a bit scary. Because uh, I have to say there's not a shred of tissue paper between what Lawrence has said in answer to his last two questions and, and what I think. So Lawrence, we, we better go out and have a chat. <laughs> um, look, I agree with Lawrence. The whole point of what I'm saying is that um, we need to approach uh, the relationship between central government on the one hand and local and regional on the other hand, a spirit of respect and partnership where central government sees itself as able to empower the delivery of good things at the local level and to encourage good things which are found in and sourced from the local level. So joined at the hip, supporting each other in working out how to uh, do that is a really good idea. And I would just like to, uh, perhaps I think we're late in the questions, close with an invitation to LGNZ to um, get our spokespeople together and sit down and just sort of nut out without prejudice what, uh, what some more granularity around that relationship might look like. Because I think that's a, um, it's an exciting project. I've got just one question I have to ask, it's for Michael actually, uh, but comment on that and then we'll close. Um, Michael, you talked about 
and I agree with this coming from a corporate world as well, about the need for uh, the council dynamic to be better for, uh, for each councillor, the need to take, take responsibility and govern in that sense and act as a team. Absolutely get that. Then you've got the political dynamic that underpins that. What's your thoughts about balancing those two? How do you do that? <laughs> um, well, you probably don't. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm not a politician. <laughs> there has to be... Um, the simple answer is that councillors need to come together on agreeing on what outcomes they can join together on. So yes, everyone is, we're all different, um, and because I helicopter into places, I've spent most of my time working with people who don't want to work with me. I think I, that works, not because we want to work together, but because we have to work together to get an outcome. So there has to be an agreement on what are the big picture items that we are going to achieve as a group, and appreciate, accept, and understand that each one of us has a different agenda and will need to play that out during the course of this marriage. It can be done, but it requires everyone to come together with the mindset to make it work. That's the key, a desire to achieve. There are two words I think is my short time in local government that matter and that the first one is democracy and the second one is governance and what Michael just said is governance. But it marries that with democracy. When you get those two humming and song you're going to get a good result. We're going to stop Kuypers and we're going to get, deliver value for our communities and that's what this is all about. And with that I'll bring the, um, the evening, uh, the full part of the evening to a close. Thank you for your attendance and your questions. Thank you David, Michael and Lawrence for attending and giving us your thoughts. And I um, invite you to have a, a little uh, bit and bob at the back there. So thank you. Cheers.